sometimes after Chris prays, I, I feel like I could say, Amen, let's go home. <laughs> that's okay. Funny. That, that's, like, that's like one of the big reasons today that I wasn't like talking during the song. It's not that I usually do that. <laughs> it's okay. I like it. Um, no. Uh, we don't coordinate, by the way. No. <laughs> Um, are there any Marvel movie fans out there in the audience there? If you haven't seen one of these Marvel movies, superhero movies, you have obviously been living under a rock or, or something, or just don't go to movies. And one of the, uh, one of the, um, Characteristics of a Marvel movie, if you if you don't know this, is the end credit scenes. If you, you know, a lot of people get up and start it up and giving up and they walk away from the movies. The, the, the movie's over, credits are running. Let's go home, go to the bathroom, let's get out of here. But Marvel has thrown in end credit scenes that gives you hits and spoilers for the next movies, right? Or sometimes they're not as Pointed, and sometimes they're just pointless, but they're there. And thus far in the story of Acts that we've read, there's been a character that pops in as what I like to call it the end credit scenes. Because in Acts chapter 8, after the stoning of Stephen, we see the introduction of Saul, where it says they laid this, the, their garments at his feet, and then we read things like Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death and the day of great persecution began against the church. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women who had put them in prison. And then we don't hear anything about Saul for a whole other chapter. It's like that end credit scene in the Avengers movie when Thanos puts the, the glove on and says, okay, I'll do it myself. That's how I've envisioned the story of Paul. And then Marvel thinks they're so slick. The Bible's been doing that before Marvel did, so it's okay. <laughs> so we've been introduced to this guy named Saul. And what we know about him from what the Bible has showed us so far the story, because I don't like to, I don't like, I don't like to teach these stories like we've read them a million times. I don't like to teach these stories like I've read them a million times. I like to teach these stories as the Bible reveals them to us, as if we don't know anything. Because, and, and what we know about him is that he's high up in, in high enough up in, in the hierarchy of the Jewish government, the Jewish religious government, that he is big enough that he can pull people out of their homes, arrest them, and approve of their deaths. He's an important character. He's an important person. He is a powerful man. Bringing us, and he was, Hated and he, he, well, I wouldn't say he was hated, but he hated Christians. He hated followers of what they called the way. And he was well known in those circles. They were afraid of him. I want us to figure, picture this in our minds, put ourselves in that place. They put us in a place where it's illegal to be a Christian. There's a governing force out to destroy us. Somebody, and there's this one individual that is the poster child of this movement. We can add names to Saul by Hitler, who was out to destroy the Jews. We can add names to them like Osama bin Laden, 
was out to destroy, who le leader, a leading and driving force to the destruction of everything that wasn't Muslim, that's just not, including and specifically Christianity. We can add names, modern names. These names are similar to what Saul of Tarsus was. Brings us to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to take these in stages because we see this in the story, it's a familiar story, or we just mentioned Saul, and we say Saul became Paul, and he was dramatic, and we know that there was a dramatic change in his life. And we know that there's a, a, a a catalyst, something that pushed him forward, that changed everything. I hear of a, heard of two story of stories of the two men who wanted to disprove Christianity. And one says, okay, I'm going to study the life of Paul. And the other one said, I'm going to study the life of Christ. And we're going to figure out where things go wrong or where the flaw is. And they studied, the guy who studied the life of Paul came back to him and he could explain everything that happened to Paul before he became a Christian. And they could explain everything that happened after he became a Christian, but they could not explain dr the dramatic change in his life. They could not say, to explain it away as suddenly he was changed, except through the power of God. Except through the power of God. Just imagine if Osama bin Laden became a Christian. I don't know, he's, he, he's no longer with us on this planet, and he's suffering in eternal torment right now, but just imagine if he had gotten saved. That's the thing that was going on here. So, Acts chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, and as he traveled, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you, what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither and neither ate nor drank. We're taking this in stages, because that's the whole concept here that I, I want to get us across. There's a, there, there are stages in this story, and stages in our transformation in Christianity. Yes, there's the sudden stages, and there, but there, there's, and not just stages into becoming a Christian, but being adopted into the Christian world. It wasn't an easy trip. I mean, this was somebody that he hated. This is somebody that the Christians were scared of. They were freaking out. This guy is coming. And he had the authority from the high priest to go and rip people out of their homes and bring them back to Jerusalem where they were going to stand trial and possibly be killed. The first stage in Paul's transformation was hearing the voice of God. The first stage in our lives in coming to Christ is hearing the call of God, right? If you think about it, Paul, Saul, had a light from heaven strike him while he was riding a horse 
to Damascus, right? He was on the middle of the road, and suddenly this bright beam of light just came down from heaven and knocked him off his horse. Those of you who know Brian Musser, just imagine him saying, no. <laughs> I, when I became a Christian, I didn't have a bright shaft of light that came beaming down in the middle of wherever I was and saying, here. I didn't hear the voice of God directly calling my name out loud. If you did, come up here and tell the story. <laughs> But in a way, we've all heard the voice of God calling us. Preachers call it in the days, the tugging of the heartstrings. Ever hear that phrase? God is tugging at your heart right now. Pulling on your heartstrings, asking you to come to Christ, calling your name. And that is a true, and there's a, there's a feeling, there's something inside of us, there's something that's going on that we just know that God is calling us or somebody is calling us to do something. It may not be the voice of God in the shaft of light. It may not be a burning bush that Moses saw. It may not be anything so dramatic as seeing Jesus on your frigid air. But there's something that you feel and you know that God is calling me and I've got to change. The conviction of the Holy Spirit hits you. The, 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 there's just something going on. I'll tell you my personal experience was oh, I prayed, I have said the sinner's prayer so many times that I knew the verbs by heart. But I, I once I just said all the nouns. I made sure I got all the nouns in. Jesus, sin, cross, forgiveness. Got it all right. And, and But there was that one day that I was sitting on the front pew of a church in a Baptist church. So there's nobody sitting in the front pew of the church. My grandma used to say, you got to come early to get a back row in a Baptist church. I don't know if I was late or I was just bothered and I was thinking of something. I just listened to somebody's testimony and I was sitting on the front row of the church and something was saying, get a hair? You missed it somewhere. I don't even think I was hair then. But anyway, but you missed it somewhere. You missed something somewhere. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit hit hard and saying there's something. The voice of God, the Spirit of God, the presence of God hits you and you know you missed something or you're missing something. This is what happened to Paul. And if you look at it, Paul had this conversation with God and he said, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Who was Paul persecuting? He wasn't persecuting Jesus directly. He was persecuting his people. But in essence, persecuting his people, he was persecuting Jesus. And God had to break through Saul in some mighty, mighty and dramatic way. I hear stories of people who are so caught up in addictions and everything else that God has to get their attention by drawing, by bringing some tremendous tragedy in their lives. God has to send a shaft of life, light and, set, and, and the form of something bad happening to me. Or call it to God. God sends a shaft of light through a friend that comes to you and just shares with you the gospel. God sends a shaft of light from preachers, a shaft of light from preachers behind pulpits on beaches in standing beside a table or on the television. The voice of God comes to you and it calls you. Love this part of the story where it says the men who were traveling with him stood speechless. They didn't hear, they heard the voice, but they saw nothing. 
Saul got up and he could not see. He was blind for three days. He never ate or drank. Extreme cases. So stage, <clears throat> stage one. Stage two starts in verse 10. Now there was a disciple in the, at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, that's my God voice, Ananias. I go deep on that one. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he was seen in a vision, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Stage two and the transformation is talking with another disciple. Talking with an elder. Talking with somebody who came before you. Praying with somebody who came before you. This is the moment in Paul's life where the altar call was given at the Billy Graham crusade and everybody comes down and they talk to the preacher at the front of the room. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the song Just As I Am, but there are at least 16 verses to that song. And there's a song that we've made famous because Billy Graham used that at every one of his uh, crusades. And uh, there have been crusades, tent meetings, and everything else where the preacher stands there and says, we're just going to sing one more verse of Just As I Am. Here's your moment to come down, we're going to sing one more verse, and at the end of that verse, we're going to say, we're going to sing one more verse, and if nobody else comes. I don't know if you've been to churches that have altar calls. I don't know if you've ever seen an altar call or been through an altar call. We don't do them very often here. But it's that moment where you go and you have an opportunity to walk down the aisle and talk to the preacher and pray with the preacher. Pray with your pastor. I remember when I came home from camp, when I first decided to follow God, my mom, this was before I actually got saved, but I do remember my mom dragging me down to the front of the church, which is very weird because after that, mom stopped going to church. But dragging me down to the, to the front of the church to talk to the preacher to talk about what we did. I remember the first time that I was in an altar call when I had to pray with a kid who was accepting Christ. Can you accept Christ and become a follower of Christ without talking and praying with somebody at first? Yeah. but to fully be embraced and fully be part of the church and to, to, uh, to, to full, get the full experience of it. One of the first and to fully understand what you're doing. Talking to somebody and praying with somebody is a good step. It's a primary step. It's a change. Of, it's a transformational step. Because suddenly you realize that not only is this a personal decision that I made, I have to share it with somebody else. I waited two years after I got 
the, my story is the fact that I prayed the prayer at a camp. I came back and I told the preacher, we baptized me. Two months later, I actually got saved. And I waited two years before I actually told somebody and prayed with somebody that I actually got saved later than after, after I got baptized. And I know that. How, that's how it happened. It sounds weird. It's odd. But, you know, I've never done anything the easy way, have I? <laughs> <laughs> and, but the, the telling of somebody, the sharing with somebody, the praying with somebody, stage two. However, we look at it this way. That means those of us who already know Christ have to be open to do being the person people share with. Ananias heard from God. Ananias heard the voice of God say, go talk to Saul. And he's like, what you talking about, God? You want me to go talk to who? He's going to kill people. And you want me to go talk to him? So we as a church must be open to talk to other people and lead them to that step and pray with them because amazing things happened, right? Amazing things. If, so, if Ananias didn't go to Saul, somebody, God would have gotten somebody else. But if somebody didn't go to Paul, God only knows he might have stayed with those scales on his eyes and not eaten for longer than three days. We have to be open as a church, if you know Christ, to know when to go. And when you just come to Christ, you've got to come and talk to somebody and tell them this is what I do. Stage two in our transformations. Stage two into becoming the church. Stage three. 19 through... Well, 19b through 22. It says, Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. Immediately, read that again, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus was the Christ. He immediately began speaking in the synagogues. Stage three is sharing your story. Telling people how you came to Christ. Some of the greatest evangelists in the world are new believers. Because they don't know what they're not supposed to say to people. They don't care. I mean, I've heard stories of youth who just came to Christ. On, they go onto the beach and they're telling everybody they can talk to about everything, about the Jesus. Let me tell you what just happened to me. Let me tell you the story about what's going on. Do they know everything about the Bible? Do they understand everything theologically and theoretically and, and, and hypothetically, ecumenic? Do they understand what evangelism is and soteriology? Do they learn what that word means? Anybody else know what that word means? No. They don't know. They only know what happened to them. And they tell people without fear, without blush. As we get older in Christ, that fear and that blush grows with us for some reason. But sharing our story and telling Paul was Saul was not afraid. I mean, Saul is a different case altogether because we learn later about him being a very educated man, very educated in, in Jewish history and Jewish law and Jewish culture. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He knew his stuff. So it's like this whole piece of Jesus being the Son of God, the, the whole piece of Jesus just put all of that information together and suddenly everything clicked and made sense. So he couldn't hold it and he had to share it with everybody else. 
There are parts in our lives that we don't understand that we're building and all of a sudden Jesus comes in and it fits in the right spot and everything else makes sense. So we need to go out and share it with people. People can't argue with your experience. People can't argue with what you went through. At least that's what I hear in modern culture today. You can't argue with my truth. My experience, this happened to me. I know what happened. And if they do argue with it, then they're being hypocrites. <laughs> Share your story. Stage three. Stage four. There's a fourth stage. Is surviving your first persecution. Verse 23. I know you hated hearing that when persecutions come. When many days had elapsed and the Jews plotted together to do away with him, being Saul. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Persecution comes. The quicker you start preaching the gospel, the quicker it comes. The, pre the, the more devoted you become to Christ, the more the persecution comes. Suddenly Saul, being the hero of these Jews, was suddenly the villain to these Jews. Almost immediately, a few days. And, I, and it happens to every one of us, maybe not to the extreme of somebody trying to kill us. Or maybe somebody shunning us. We're afraid to get shunned by our friends. I hear the story of uh, Greg Laurie from Harvest Ministries. He was telling his his uh, testimony on the radio the other day, and he was saying how he would hide his Bible when he was around with certain people because he didn't want them to know what he was. <clears throat> and there were other times that he just let it go and sort of started sharing with people and telling people. And, and we're afraid of even the smallest persecution. And a friend from India came over. I, I knew while, uh, he was, while I was in college. His name was M.E. Daniel. He became a Christian. And people found out and they beat him almost to death. And left him lying by a river. Obviously he survived because he told me the story. Spoiler alert. But when we first become a Christian, sometimes the first persecution scares us away and causes us to go and hide. And that, that boldness we had in stage three disappears in stage four because of that. Or sometimes it's, it's empowering and it helps us to grow better. That's what we need to look at it at this point. Not that, oh no, they're going to hate me, they're going to hate me. It's like, well, they're going to hate me, but they hated Jesus too. It doesn't matter. Let's keep moving forward. Let's share this persecution. Let's get going. Let's get moving. Let's do something. Let's keep moving forward because God is with me. And if God is with me, who can be against me? Amen. Mm -hmm. Stage for surviving your first persecution. It's not the power of your power, it's the power of God who helps you do that. And the final, well, the final stage in this story is stage five. And I'm gonna read verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and not believing he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him 
and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had a talk to him and now and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they fought him. They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, <coughs> being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Fifth stage is finding your place in the church. Even the, the, God has always said there's no such thing as a solo Christian. There's no lone ranger Christians. Paul could not do anything that he did by himself. If you read in the, the future, in the, the future, and other stories, he always had somebody with him. Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and If you read the book of the Acts written from Luke, you see at some points of time when he was, Luke was talking about the journeys of Paul, he said, we, we're going. This is where we were. So Luke traveled with Paul. Paul never went anywhere alone. But if Paul had to figure out how to fit himself in the church, and some people, if some people got saved and walked through the front door of our church, we will sit there and we will have questions on whether or not they actually got saved or whether they're supposed to be here. It's human nature, personality. And coming into a church as a new believer, as a new Christian, is hard. Because you look at these people and you're like, I don't know anybody here. These people are weird. These people are freaky. They are talking the words I've never heard before. They're saying hallelujahs and amens and, and raising hands. When, when do I, especially if you go to a church that they, they, they already have the calisthenics in, where you kneel at certain times, you stand up at certain times, cross yourself, whatever. And you're like, I didn't know the words. I sat in a Catholic church once sat through a Catholic ceremony and service once and, and there were times that people spoke just at the same time and I'm like I didn't get the script <laughs> Did, I didn't have time I don't know what, what's the word you know, I didn't know that there were scripts to memorize okay, they changed the script like you know, six or eight years ago <laughs> and I'm still working on the old script so Finding a church, finding a place in the church is difficult because you're worried. You don't fit in. At this point in time, God provided Barnabas who reached out and helped Paul find a place. So this is this message, if you notice, is on double levels here on what you need to do when you first become a Christian and what we Christians need to do to help those people. It doesn't matter who they are. They could be the worst, loudest liberal or conservative, depending on which side that you are on, who you just process and fight that totally disagrees with everything that you are and everything that you say. But if they come to Christ, it is our job as Christians, as believers, to help them fit in. Help them not fit in. Not change them. But help them know that they belong. And show the world that this person is not, show the church world that this person is now a believer in Christ. This is a brother in Christ. This is somebody who loves Jesus and who Jesus loves as much as he loves the rest of us. Finding a place 
in the church, of going throughout all that awkwardness and being that Barnabas to other people and helping, knowing that we're all in this boat together. That's a that's the lessons we can get from the story. This conversion. We've been calling this series aftermath. An aftermath of a war, aftermath of an event. There's always messes to clean up. There's changes that are made. And one of the biggest changes in the world was the fact that this guy who hated Christians became one. The fact that God can speak through and speak into and change lives so dramatically and that's an amazing thing. The uh, <laughs> movies of our lives are just beginning. The changes in our lives are just beginning. And the question is to the church and to the people, are we ready? Are we ready for those people to walk in through our doors that are scared, that are nervous, and that have been changed dramatically by the power and the love of God? Father God, thank you for the story of Paul. Thank you for the story of a dramatic change. God, help us as a church be ready for folks. Help us as individuals to be the Ananiases, the Barnabases, <coughs> reach out to people that A, we're scared of, B, we're worried about, C, that we just didn't like it first. But Lord God, help us to change this world. Will you Help us be the lights. Help us shine the light. Help us show the world your love and your truth and your grace, Lord Jesus. And Father God, may you change hearts and souls and lives through the power of your cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.